like to, to start by thanking uh, the several people and organizations uh, who made the Marie Dariusek's visit to the University of Arizona possible, uh, the cultural services of the French Embassy, uh, Patricia de Rider and the Alliance Française uh, of uh, Tucson, the African Studies Program, uh, Javier Duran at the Confluence Center for Critical Inquiry, Larry Evers in the Department of English, uh, Fabien Alfi at the Department of French and Italian, Marie Wilner Bassett, the Dean of the College of the Humanities, and the School of International Languages, Literatures and Cultures. I also want to thank uh, Gail Brown, the Executive Director of the UA Poetry Center, where we are now, uh, for their hospitality in this uh, very beautiful room for the presentation. And before I introduce our guest, uh, I also want to remind you of a few things. Marie Dariusek's novels uh, that were translated, that are available in uh, English translation, are available uh, at the main uh, U of A bookstore. Uh, it's, uh, they are on display over there, so I encourage you to take a look. Uh, the customer service desk by the Starbucks. And uh, after our lecture tonight, uh, if some of you uh, brought some of your copies and we had uh, mentioned that you could, uh, you know, feel free to talk to uh, Marie Dariusek and have her sign uh, your copy if you would like to do that or, or talk to her, she'd be more than happy to, to do that. Uh, and finally, there will be uh, two other opportunities to interact with our guest uh, on a more uh, informal uh, basis tomorrow. Uh, for anyone really interested, uh, faculty, students, or members of the, the community, uh, to dialogue with Marie Dariusek. So tomorrow it will take place in Modern Languages Building in room uh, 504. Modern Languages Building 504. And so there will be a possibility to dialogue in French. That will be between 3 p.m. and 4.15 p.m. Or in English, if you don't speak French, uh, that will be between 5 and 6.15 p.m. tomorrow, okay? All right, so Marie Dariusek is one of the leading French novelists uh, writing today. She describes herself on the website as an atheist, a feminist, and a European woman. She's originally uh, from the Pays Basque country in, uh, in France, in the southwest region of France, and for as far as she can remember, she has always liked to write, including when she was studying French literature at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. It is there, during a summer break, that she wrote her first published novel that would become an immediate national and international sensation in 1996, Truisme, or, in the English translation, Pig Tales, a novel of lust and transformation. This is the story of a young woman who progressively transforms herself into a pig. In addition to English, the novel has been translated into more than 40 languages. The Times called it at the time one of the most weirdly inventive novels of recent years. Since then, Marie Dariusek has published nine additional novels, as well as short stories, plays, essays, and articles in the press such as one of our most recent published in London's The Guardian on the uses of Madame and Mademoiselle in France. Several of her works have been adapted for the theatre and played in places such as Argentina, Iceland or the Theatre Festival of Avignon in France. Since 2006, Marie Dariusek is also a psychoanalyst. But this visit is also my opportunity to publicly thank Marie for her enthusiasm and availability with my students uh, throughout the years first at the University of Rhode Island, and now here at the University of Arizona. From the first time I contacted her back in 2001, Marie Dariusek and her publisher P.O.L. have been great partners to our students. They offer them a unique opportunity to regularly dialogue with Dariusek about her novels read in class uh, via the official website Marie Dariusek, so dariusek.arizona.edu which was created in 2001 and which is maintained by my students and myself to this day. Students in the Digital Humanities class of last year uh, created original works based upon their reading of uh, Dariusek uh, novels. Others have interviewed her and dialogued with her via Skype and blogs. Marie even generously contributes original text for the website and shares with us original pages of her manuscripts written by hand and arranges for POL, our publisher, to regularly send us photos, book covers, and many other documents we use to up update the site. One funny aspect of maintaining Marie's website is that all correspondence sent to Marie uh, via the site lands in my inbox. 
Marie asked me if I did not mind doing it, uh, and I am grateful for her trust. But this has resulted in some interesting emails that I received <laughs> on behalf of Mary, including love declarations. <laughs> so, we are always looking for uh, undergraduate and graduate students to work for credits on the Marie Dariusek website, so you do not have to know French uh, to be involved, and uh, if you are interested, you can contact me uh, after this. The title of Marie Dariusek's lecture tonight is A Dream About the Forest, Imaginations of Africa in the Mind of a French French Basque writer. Please welcome Marie Dariusek. Thank you, Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here because, as Alain Philippe told you, um, we've been in contact for years around this website. And um, I tried to come many times in Rhode Island, and a lot of things prevented me, and, and now I'm very happy to be here. Um, so this is about not so much the forest, uh, I have to say, but about, in fact, the vision of Africa in France nowadays, and in my mind too. But there were many political, political things happening this past weeks, actually, in, in France, around Africa, that led me to this speech tonight. Um, Perhaps I should tell you a story first about the French vision of some French people about Africa. Every Tuesday morning, I have a chronicle on the French national radio station called France Culture. Just last week, the guest of the day was Henri Guénaud, who is uh, President Sarkozy's special advisor. So he's the special advisor of the president of the French Republic. This guy, Henri Guénaud, in 2007, very soon after Sarkozy was elected, wrote a speech for him, for the president, addressed to young Africans in a university in Dakar, Senegal. So the speech was delivered by Sarkozy, and it's a very controversial, controversial speech that is also greatly admired by certain people, and this speech is known as the Dakar speech, the Discours de Dakar. <coughs> so, during this chronicle on the French National Radio, I quoted long parts of this speech in front of Henri Guénaud, who wrote it. And he considered my quoting his own sentences in the electoral context, because as you know, we are going to elect a new president very soon. He considered my quoting as dishonest, improper, and disgraceful. And he was there on, on the radio on Nicolas Sarkozy's speaking time as a candidate and our live argument on the radio and his edginess about what, what he felt was impertinent on my behalf created a small French scandal. And it seemed to, be, to me to be quite the opposite. I thought it was most appropriate and legitimate, now that the government's track record has to be made, to remain the person who had advised the president for five years about his own words. The same president, Nicolas Sarkozy, delivered a magnificent speech on slavery in May 11. Those two speeches, as con contradictory as they may be, are accessible on the Elysee website, the site of the Présidence de la République, for those of you who would like to read them if you have nothing better to do. But before going any further, here is the chronicle I gave on the radio and that annoyed the President's advisor so much. So the Dakar speech begins by criticizing the ravages of colonization and slavery, and it takes up 10% of the entire text of the speech. And it ends in reminding us that colonization also brought bridges, roads, I quote, hospitals, fruit clinics, schools, and fertility to barren lands. And it, the speech concludes by stating that, I quote, for better and for worse, colonization has transformed the African man and the European man, end of quotation. Already, I think it's quite questionable to place on an equal base the better and the worst of colonization. If colonization were a marriage, it would be a forced one. Yeah. Henri Guénaud, in the beginning of his speech, quotes a poem by Aimé Césaire. Aimé Césaire is a famous uh, Martinique uh, poet, black poet. Let's go back to Césaire, to one of his own speeches then, his discourse on colonialism in 1950. Césaire was already mentioning the disloyalty, as he put it, of the colonialist cliché that would legitimize a posteriori by the obvious material progress, the systematic sacking of colonial enterprise. End of quotation. As for Henri Guénaud, in his speech, he continued by stating that all colonists are not thieves, all colonists are not exploiters. 
end of quotations, as if the fact that some individuals were not bastards exempted colonialism from being a general plundering. And that was another classic legitimization that Césaire had identified in his times. The remaining 90% of the Dakar speech contains two principal ideas, prize for the African man close to childhood and nature and friendly encouragement for him to come out of this immobility. I quote Ari Guénaud, President Sarkozy's special advisor. I came to tell you that modern man who feels the need to be reconciled with nature has much to learn from African man who has been living in symbiosis with nature for thousands of years. I quote, Africa's drama is that African man hasn't come into its tree enough. The African peasant who has been living with the seasons for thousands of years and whose ideal for life is to be in harmony with nature only knows the eternal cycle of time in rhythm to the endless repetition of the same gestures and the same words. In this world where everything is always repeating itself, there is no place for human adventure or for the idea of progress. In this new universe where nature rules over everything, African man escapes from the anguish of history that torments modern man, and man remains immobile in the midst of an unchanging order in which everything seems to have been inscribed beforehand. Never could man throw himself into the future. Never could he have the idea of stepping out of the repetition to invent his own destiny. The problem with Africa, and allow a low friend of Africa to say so, is there. End of quotation. So that was the presidential speech in front of young Africans five years ago. Aimé Césaire, of course, has a totally different explanation for Africa's drama. He says, he wrote in the 50s, the greatest historical drama of Africa is less its being too late to establish contact with the rest of the world, rather than the way this contact was made. Europe propagated itself at a time when Europe fell into the hands of bankers and the most unscrupulous industrial tycoons. Our bad luck was meeting this Europe along our way, and Europe is accountable for the highest heap of corpses before the human community." End of quotation. Césaire speaks of the historical moment from his point of view in the 50s, whereas the Dakar speech is inspired by the bicentennial thesis of Hegel in Reason in History, you know, on the African man close to childhood, magic and nature, inaccessible to reasoning and to the movement of history. That's an imagery that ends up for better in traditional cliches and for worse with Gobineau's idea that history only exists in white nations. I ended my chronicle on the radio in front of the writer of the speech by a last quote from the speech. So the, quote, the quotation is, among others, okay? Africa reminds all the peoples of the earth that we have shared the same childhood. Africa has aroused the simple joys, ephemeral happiness, and the need to believe rather than to understand, the need to feel rather than to reason, and to be in harmony rather than to conquer. This long speech tries to be awkwardly generous, but it is totally discredited by the stupefying resurgence of clichés we would have thought were long bygone. A French Senegalese professor in Oxford, Hélène Neveu, told me that she had translated certain passages in English from the speech and asked her students to tape them. Their answer was, in the middle of the 19th century. In any case, they didn't think the author was posterior to Cecil Rhodes. You know, Cecil Rhodes founded the Cape Colony in the late 19th century, as well as Rhodesia, named after him. So France, according to Henri Guénaud's, Henri Guénaud's vision, is turned towards itself and a vision of Africa that ignores modernity. And I have to say, who in France today reads Roy Shuinka, who was a Nobel Prize winner in the 80s, and his contemporary, Chinua Achebe, to mention only them? Actually, sometimes I feel we are like 10 or 20 to read them, and Chinua Achebe is not even translated anymore in France. And sometimes I think about translating him. Things fall apart, you know. Why is there this francophone obstinacy to remain with withdrawn in our narrow vision of the world when Nigeria, South Africa, and all the black diaspora take an active part in the invention of globality? Henri Guénaud refers to the francophone black poets Senghor and Césaire, but it is a selective recourse. It's the pantheonized Césaire, the one of the beautiful poems, not the Césaire of the virulent speeches. It is the Senghor 
who of the negritude. There are a lot of things to say about the negritude, but Senghor is also a very controversial figure, even in Africa. He was highly criticized by Soyinka. Uh, Senghor was um, a man who, in his vision of negritude, um, uh, emphasized uh, the, the black man about his sensitivity, cosmic reason, and intuitive reason, I quote, as opposed to logical reason. And Sartre called the negritude an anti-racist racism. So it was criticized by some Africans themselves. The, the English colonizers never tried to assimilate their colonized as the French did there. English violence was in radical separation, which is why Francophone poets like Senghor and Césaire had to affirm to the French people that they indeed were black. This heritage determines the typically French embarrassment today about the apprehension and the designation of those who are perceived as others. Embarrassment that leads to expressions such as, very recently again last week, Nicolas Sarkozy on the French radio talking very awkwardly about people of Muslim appearance, des gens d'apparence musulmane, but also uh, about François Hollande, on the socialist part, so François Hollande proposition to take the word race out of the French constitution. It's very, very difficult in France to, to say the word race. It's almost forbidden for many reasons that I will try to expose. And it's a very complex proposition that while trying to avoid discrimination, would also risk nourishing the confusion in the French discourse on so-called diversité. I'll talk about that a bit later. Again about this Dakar speech in July 7. To crown it all, it was delivered at the Sheikh Anta Diop University. And Sheikh Anta Diop was precisely the researcher who inaugurated historiology from the African point of view. He was among the people who said there is an African history. It's incredible to have to remind top-level politicians that Africa history does actually, actually exist. It's written differently, but there are many African and European authors today to resurrect and unfurl it. We should really be asking ourselves why a certain Europe and a certain France needs to believe that Africa has no history. So I've got some friends in Africa, intellectual friends like Mamadou Diouf in uh, Senegal, who, who commented about this speech. Contempt springing from so much ignorance, he wrote. Boubacar Boris Diop, another thing Senegalese. The most wretched cliches of colonial ethnology. Uh, Achille Membe, who is from Cameroon. An obsolete intellectual heritage, almost a century old. There are very alive authors who reacted immediately to the Dakar speech and who do not need an European to come and explain Africa to them and who cannot be suspected of reducing their vision to a victimized reading. Many of them denounced this president of the French Republic who had come to African soil to urge the young to decide on democracy without saying a word about what we call France Afrique, about the scandals, about the collusion of political and petrochemical interests, and about the French supporting, I quote again, Membe, the satraps in a system of reciprocal corruption. And to end this, what about the sentence uttered by Sarkozy in this speech. I haven't come here to speak to you about repentance. Shouldn't that be for the ex-colonized to decide about repentance? Now, for a second part, another story, maybe a bit lighter, another French story about my childhood. And I have to tell you, I'm not a specialist at all of Africa, just a French writer trying to understand um, something of the world. For many years during my childhood in a little Basque village, Africa was, to me, a little black boy, boy called François, who had been adopted in my home village by a Catholic family who already had about seven children of their own. I have forgotten which country François came from, but in my imagination, I associated him with lions and tigers. I thought there were tigers in Africa. With women standing and moving sticks up and down to some mysterious end, and some years later, with famine and pictures of Ethiopia on the television. François had never seen a lion, and it was only later on in life, when he left the village primary school, as we all did, to go to the high school in a neighboring big town, that he was called by a racist name, and that suddenly to our eyes, or certainly to mine, he looked black and I white. 
I knew he was supposed to be an African, but was he? Can you be African at the age of 12 or 11 when you've been a member of a white family in the south of France since you were a newborn and their welcome gift was to change your first name into Francois? There's no, you can't imagine a more French name than Francois. I had known up to that point that he was African, but not that he was black. Having always known him, I had never seen him. And because he always wore the same red anorak handed down from his many brothers and sisters of adoption, I would, as a child, refer to him to my parents as the little red boy. And my parents would nod their head wisely, François. They would say his name as if, if it weren't actually his real name, as if this name masked a secret and that the secret was Africa. I saw his expression, his eyes, his way of laughing, of playing football, of fighting, neither more or less than the other village boys, but I didn't see his color. The moment when I understood that he was black and I white was when the village agreed as if as one to remind him of his luck of being adopted, adopted into a rich country which was not around the world with an Eiffel Tower that was easily located by all on the planet. Francois was black and he had had, apparently, the extreme luck of being adopted by whites. I carefully examined my skin, the fine skin of the inner, on, on my inner right arm, to be more specific, and I saw that it wasn't white, it isn't white, but a very pale beige with thick blue ropes, which, were, which are veins, and fine red threads, which carry the blood to my heart. And there are also beauty spots, and three of which form actually a tiny tower Ethel, which at that time I had only seen on the, on, the, on the photo, but it's there, it's very tiny. And it was almost a whole landscape, and I would have loved to examine Francois's arm in as much detail, not to know whether he had an African landscape on the inside of his arm, just to be able to hold it. Anyway, in about uh, 1982 or 83, I went mad as more or less all the French young and old became mad. Mitterrand had just been elected, it was our first socialist president. And I still think personally, 30 years later, that it was rather a good piece of news on a global scale. Anyway, we all wore badges in the shape of a yellow hand, which had suddenly, anyway, I'm going to show it to you because I have, it's an antique, it's an antique. But I've found one, where is it here? So we all wore, I was in high school, we all wore it. Are there any French people here? You remember that? <laughs> and on that badge, on that hand, edited by SOS Racisme, an association, socialist association of the Mitterrand um, um, surroundings, the, the, le, le, le slogan, the slogan is Touche pas à mon pote which can be translated by, don't touch my body, my body, body, my body, my body. Touche pas mon pote. So, <clears throat> SOS, racism took it, took, <laughs> SOS Racism took to its extreme the wonderful republican logic of liberté, égalité, fraternité. We were all free, but more importantly, we were all equal and very much all brothers, no one's spoke of sisters at that time. Mm -hmm. To say that all people were equal was to say that they were all the same, and that's very French, carried by one mother, the French Republic. So no one was different, and Francois wasn't different. He was black, but he was a brother to everybody in France, not only the little family uh, in the village, an adopted brother perhaps, but brother nonetheless, and therefore alike, the same. The fact that some people stubbornly insisted on seeing him as different was incomprehensible to me. He was black, but according to SOS Racism, that had nothing to do with anything. He was born in Africa, and his pigmentation was, shall we say, unusual, but it didn't change anything. If that logic was continued, he was like us. Therefore, he was white. The popular song on the radio of the day, middle of the 80s, said that we were all of the same color, and now I'm going to sing, which is <laughs> and I'm sure Alain Philippe and some people here will remember the song. Le soleil donne la même couleur aux gens, la même couleur aux gens, gentiment. So that was a song from the 80s by Laurent Voulzy, and I love that song. And it means the sun gives all people, people the same color sweetly. And that was a sort of hymn 
of those years, of those naively, innocently anti-racist years. I like that song very much and I had absolutely no sense of irony and I listened to it as one does a religious service when one believes with zeal and eyes full of tears. The leaders of SOS Racisme were really nice people, but they also had neither humor of irony. They would hand out ideologic to ideological tools as if they were handing out sweets and badges shaped like yellow hands. And these tools had more or less the same impact as sweets, the same vaguely threatening power over the world, over the reality. Thirty years later, I recall with some affection the brief time when we wore those badges. Some of the leaders are still in the Socialist Party, like Arlem Désir. But the Socialist Party has not been in power in France for a long time, and its leaders have been replaced by other leaders with even less humor. <laughs> the new leaders have a kind of cynical irony which has made them invent, for example, it was uh, five years ago, the Ministry for Immigration and the National Identity, like a huge joke. Except that it's not a joke, but a direct reminder of the worst years of French fascism under the Vichy government, which collaborated so effortlessly with the Nazis during the Second World War. There was a Ministry of Immigration and National Identity at that time, and it was against the Jews, basically. Another joke invented by these new leaders is, for example, to invent that François is not French. François has returned to being extremely black and African since the new French administration, which no longer wears that little yellow hand on, this lap, on its lapel, since that administration discovered that he was not born on French soil, and discovered too that most of the ills of our beautiful and mighty country come from immigrants, and especially illegal immigrants. Immigration has become a national obsession, nourished by the constant provocations of the Front National, the Front National, the extreme right party. All these administrative efforts have virtually turned François into an illegal immigrant ever since he decided to request a passport to be able to travel out of France and had to furnish proof that he was French. One of these proofs, apparently, but insufficiently, is to have been born on the soil and from the stock of this beautiful and mighty country where once oaks and golds grew. But if you have not been born on that soil, this type of absent-mindedness is not easily forgiven in France today. Even if you explain that you thought that you were French, given that you were adopted by a family of white Catholics, going back to Charlemagne at least. <laughs> Although this is still to be proved, given that Francois' white Catholic mother was actually born in Algiers six months after the independence of Algeria, which could make a, of a whole brood of little white Catholics, should the administration decide to them, ask them for the proof of their nationality, ideal candidates for the holding cells reserved for illegal immigrants at the airport in Paris. Anyway, Francois tells me that it is impossible for him to prove his Frenchness because no one can tell him exactly what it means to be French, what the national identity is made up of, nor why exactly the national identity is threatened by him, or more broadly speaking, by immigration. His birth certificate says he was born in Bamako, without any mention of his biological parents. Under the heading father, there is a blank, and for mother, there is also a white space. That doesn't augur well. All this was triggered by his foolish idea to go to Bamako with his wife and two children, whose nationality has suddenly been rendered vague, since their father doesn't have a proper nationality to speak of, unless it is Malian, but he's never been to Mali, except for the first two months in the orphanage, if we get my drift. Francois wanted to go to Bamako to see if he could find them there, some sort of trace of his arrival on Earth, a small key left on the ground, perhaps, by creatures who, in another space, give people metaphysical papers for eternity. But he has not been able to go and see, because if he leaves France, he will most probably not be able to come back. I mean, he will not be able to come back home. That's the story of Francois, who is a French teacher, by the way. It's a typical French story at the moment. Again, about some typical French, let's say, racism. You know, perhaps, about, it's hard to explain, the French tradition of laïcité, which is very French, and it's a good tradition, a generous tradition. 
La laïcité radically separates state and church, government and religion since 1905. It's a law. This tradition nourishes the republican ideal that everybody, without consideration of religion, sex, sex and race, has the same rights. Not only the same rights, but again, is basically the same, as in my little story about François. It's a beautiful idea in the origin. It protects the right to everybody to have his or her own religion, race and sexuality, and not to be persecuted for it. But it leaves little room to think the difference, and in some paradoxical cases, to accept it. I'm very deeply laic, but I'm aware that it leads to some problems. The colonialist concept of assimilation has been replaced by integration, but it departs from the same ambiguous ideal. If you are not French, but if you try enough, you're welcome to become it. So you will disappear, absorbed by France, except that in fact you will never look French. That's what the Martinican psychiatrist and philosopher Franz Fanon described in his, as early as uh, the, the early 50s in his book black skin, white masks. It is so deeply rooted in the French subconsciousness, or even consciousness, that a French is white, and from a Catholic background, he or she can be an atheist, but that's another question, but it is so deeply rooted that a French is white and from a Catholic background, that we hear all the time in the mouth of our politicians from all sides such crazy sentences as I told you last week, for example, musulman d'apparence, or on the socialist part, Martine Aubry, a woman that I like very much, but who said, des Françaises et des femmes maghrébines. She wanted to describe the diversity of our cities, and she spoke about French women and Arab women, forgetting that these Arab women are French too. So uh, the French politics are always very embarrassed, very awkward. We can't suspect these politicians to be racist but they are incredibly ill at ease when they come to speak about immigrants and about the children of the immigrants who are born in France, about what was called five or six years ago the visible minorities, the minorité visible, and is called now by another euphemism, la diversité. As if being Basque was not a part of French diversity. Je me sens, I feel very diverse. But I'm white, so that's another question. And again, when the socialist leader and presidential candidate François Hollande has proposed to erase the very word race from the Constitution in an attempt to prevent further discrimination, I'm afraid that the opposite may occur, and at the very least, it may bring even more confusion in the way the French speak about the other. I think it was also a disgraceful sign of the time when Guerlain, the one of the famous Guerlain perfumes, formulated last year on TV an incredibly blunt, racist stereotype about black people, apparently to try to be funny. He was condemned last week to 6,000 euros for injure racial, racist insult. <coughs> when I he heard it, this racist insult, I had the impression of hearing my great-grand-uncle from the Basque country, who was not at all from the same social background as Monsieur Guerlain, my great-grand-uncle was a fisherman, but who had worked in the colonies in West Africa during the 30s. He came back from there stuffed with stereotypes, and he couldn't see a black person, only on TV, because the only black person in the whole Basque country was actually Francois, but he couldn't see <laughs> an exotic apparition on TV without enunciating a long litany of stereotypes that I spare you. And of course, he would threaten me as a child to be devoured by these cannibals, and he took a phony accent where the typical French air were ill-pronounced. This accent was used by a famous and still alive French stand-up comic, Michel Leb, until the end of the 80s. And I would frequently see him in his TV shows when I was a child. This accent, racist accent, is called l'accent banania, the banania accent. Mm. Banania is a whole story in itself. Banania is a very popular French brand of chocolate that still shows a caricatural black man on its products. But renounced to his famous slogan, only um, six years ago, the slogan goes Yabon. And Yabon means it's good, and it derives from the pidgin French supposedly used by the Senegalese soldiers, you know, les, ter les tirailleurs Senegalais, during the First World War. It, it is, in fact, an invention. But it was coined in the stereotype, stereotype of the happy, childish 
friend of the children, unable to speak correctly the noble language of Molière. Unable to be French, in fact, even when his or her children are born on the French ground. So I'm going to show you images of the banana chocolate, because with an iPad you can do everything. So I'm going to show you the image that was used during my childhood. So this is the box of chocolate by Banania. Okay, everybody sees it. But I'm going to show you now the, 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 the box of today. So it's been adapted, but I, I still think it's. I, I still think it's pretty racist. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure in other countries it would be accepted. I, I, I don't know. It's very naively. I don't know. Anyway, and Franz Fanon, still this um, philosopher, wrote something interesting. I was surprised that he got interested in banana. But he wrote that, um, again, in Black Skin, White Mass. He mentions the banana greening Senegalese terrailleur as an example of, he says, how in a burgeoning consumer culture, the black man appears not only as an object, but as an object in the midst of other objects. I think it's interesting. So when I heard Mr. Guerlain about you know, the chic perfumes joke, I thought it was because he was senile, because he was very old, he was 72. But no, I think it's a part of a whole racist system that is, in fact, perhaps unconscious, but very much alive. Because racism today in France proceeds, you know, wearing a mask, il avance masqué, as Descartes would say. Racism today in France claims to be a sort of objective common sense, repressed and censored by the political correctness that misplaces it for the old racism Guerlain style. The new racism, who doesn't say its name, pretends to fight against the old racism, the one who biologized the difference. That's why this new racism needs all men like Guerlain to erect so bluntly and even naively expressions of the, of the traditional racism. Because the mo modern racist can then say, see, we are not like him. And like Claude Guéant, the actual Ministry of Interior, who was the one who founded the Ministry of Immigration of a National Identity, Claude Guéant had very recently again, on February 4, this year, said things about the inferiority of civilizations. Again, things that no one thought would appear again, would be heard again. Given that these new racists don't speak about inferiority of races anymore, According to them, racists do that, but they still think there are, you know, scales of civilization, or even more underhand, in a distorted way, they would speak about the inferiority of some specific behaviors that they would present out as outdated practices, and that's typically what happened with many controversies. I'm going to try to be shorter here, but it, there was many controversies in France about the veil for women for Muslim women, or the halal way of killing the, the cows for, for butchery. This subject regularly comes back in the French debate, especially in times of election, and are used in a way to divide the population and radicalize the anti-immigration feeling. First, I, I have to say that, let's be clear about this, as a semi-vegetarian, I'm not defending any slaughtering technique. But the halal is attacked not out of compassion for animals, but to stigmatize the population. And as a feminist, I am against the veil, but so I am against the exhibition of naked women in almost every single newspaper stand of France. What I'm telling here is that I'm concerned with the political and racist exploitation of these social facts, with the lines of continuity between colonial racism and its conscious or unconscious life after the wars of decolonization. Again, Franz Fanon was very clear about it. According to him, the racist ideology dismembers its object in order to better isolate its fragment for the purpose of ridiculing them or of presenting them as threatening, typically the veil of the halal. It can also be the smell of African cooking, according to former President Chirac in the early 90s. Uh, Chirac uh, parlait du bruit et de l'odeur. 
which was a, well, anyway. Sometimes I feel ashamed to be French. But France is not only that. And a bit later I will talk about how we can also be welcoming, but let's, let's end with that. To manufacture such controversies aims to detach and isolate bits and pieces of a broader cultural identity in order to essentialize and stigmatize it, typically uh, attacking the veil or the, or the halal um, way of slaughtering the cow, is, is also reducing the, the French Arabs to one religion. All the French Arabs are not Muslims. So um, they can be a face like a lot of French people. I'm going to try to be shorter here. So sometimes, sometimes those in power consider it a duty to constantly remind us in, of, this, of the danger of immigration by isolated customary elements of the other's culture, which then they, they then present as threatening, as phobic objects that nurture anxiety and rejection. And Franz Fanon, uh, you read Franz Fanon, it, it, it's um, an amazing uh, philosopher, um, examines the way in which the black or the Arab is invented as a phobic object. To be black or to be Arab is to be the other, and this other is recognized by his impossibility both to integrate or to be invisible, to be free for his or her racial assignation. And so he must constantly provide proof of his being human in the same way as others, I quote Fanon, a human being who is like us, who is us, who is of us. That's the way Fanon deconstructed the, the French vision of the other as a phobic object. And today, the phobic object is also constructed as a threatening terrorist. And that's how there is um, a global um, inflation, you say, um, an assimilation of migration and terrorism. That's another subject. About my next novel, and I will finish like that on that, because I'm sorry, but the, the French... Um, Politics were so tough, so um, annoying in, in a way, those, this past month, because of the coming election, that as, um, you know, in general I write, but sometimes I become an intellectual. An intellectual is uh, somebody, an, is an artist who has to, you know, do this and hear, oh, what's, what's happening? Oh, m maybe, maybe I should try to do something. And it's, uh, it's also very dangerous for artists because it prevents you from creating because the best I have to do is to write, but sometimes I just can't sit in my room, you know, I have to, I have to do something. So, but anyway, my next novel is about, so perhaps you will understand all these things about Africa, is about a black man and a white woman who fall in love between France, a francophone country on the west coast of Africa, and Los Angeles. It's basically a novel about passion, and I won't tell you much more because for the moment it's all in my mind. She may be an actress and he may be a movie maker, but I'm not sure yet. It's a novel in between the topics of race and gender, but it's mostly about getting lost, about the self of the other, about a woman and her father too, it's about dream and reality, and I hope it will completely outgrow the sometimes stifling topics of race and gender. And when I say outgrow, I'm also thinking about the forest. I've been lucky enough to visit some parts of Africa, such as Côte d'Ivoire, Ethiopia, and South Africa. But I'm now planning a trip to Gabon, Gabon, to see a bit of the equatorial forest and the Ogwe River. It will be a novel about the forest, a forest of words too, a speaking forest. The imagination of the forest was the planned title of this conference, but that, as I told you, I got annoyed and nervous this past week, so, but anyway, the novel will not follow a political path or as novels do. And I think, for example, among other books, Mary Kingsley, Travel Memoirs, The Funk Art and History of Pygmy Myth are on the whole much more inspiring than Mr. Guénaud or Mr. Guérin wrong speeches. Now a last word about France. You see how my imagination of Africa first quite rustic, as developed in a complex country, which is also, I am happy to say, a welcoming country. For example, at school and in the hospitals. Schools and the hospitals are free for everybody. School is free and compulsory until the age of 16. And I volunteer to teach creative writing in clichy sous bois who is uh, one of the poorest surroundings of Paris, in a school. The kids are uh, 13, 14, it's not a high school, middle school. Middle school yeah. 
Absolutely all of my 21 students are children of immigrants. Um, some of them don't speak French, which is a bit complex for creative writing, but I manage. There's a Turkish guy who's been in France for two months only, and a Cameroonese Cameron girl who speaks French, French Cameroonese, but doesn't write it. They don't pay anything, and their meal at school is also free. Very often it's the, it's the only meal, or healthy meal they have, at least. The system is very welcoming, but it's very idealistic too, because these kids are supposed to be absorbed by the Republic, but they are not given any specific French lessons, for example, which is crazy. But well, we manage. Another topic. I remember, that's another little story, private story, but I remember sharing my room at the hospital when I had my second child with an illegal immigrant from Congo who had twins and a Caesar section. And she had exactly the same rights as me. She was simply seen there in that public hospital as a pregnant woman who had to be assisted in an emergency. She didn't have to pay anything, just like me. And every night her husband would come to visit and we would eat grilled pig ears as a delicacy, which reminds me of my first novel. It was strictly <laughs> forbidden to bring food from the outside, but we all did. I'm still in contact with her and our twins are in perfect health. They were born exactly the day my daughter was born, eight years ago, and they attend school in Paris, which is interesting. I don't know if it's um, uh, symptomatic, but one of the twins say she's not Congolese, she's French. The other one says exactly the opposite. And their mother, their mother could never have, um, she could never obtain a long visa, so she's illegal still today. She works, but uh, she's still subject to be sent back to Congo anytime. But their mothers say they will outgrow this issue to find their own balance. I know they will find obstacles on their way, but I also know they are a part of France. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. We have time for questions and discussion, of course. So what I'm going to do is turn on this one here. Um, and uh, if you can just like, you know, while you parle après, et puis uh, comme ça, moi, je, I can walk around if uh, and bring the microphone to anyone. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm just, I was just kind of interested by your comment that you um, needed to become an intellectual, but, but really you feel your calling is to be a novelist and to create. Could you tell us a little bit more about the radio show that you do every week? Um, is it particularly culture? It involves okay. politics, obviously. That's very. Thank you for, for thank you for this question because I, I still wonder today if I should do it or not <laughs> because uh, <coughs> I've been hired for this radio show only three months ago. It's very recent. I really like doing it because it's uh, it's it's a big change from my routine. Uh, I have to get up early. I have to give this chronicle at uh, uh, 7.38 exactly. It's very early for me. So I have to, to get up. I have to be ready. Uh, I have to write the chronicle before because it's live, so I, I can't you know, uh, stutter or anything. And um, I was, it, it's a bit of a long story, but I was hired in this France Culture Radio. France Culture is a very, very good radio, and, it, um, and there are quite a lot of people now who listen to it. Almost, it's amazing, almost two million people listen every morning to that, uh, between seven and nine every morning, which is a lot, because it's quite an ambitious and a, a intellectual radio. And I was hired, and I know why, because I, I'm a woman. Because this radio, when you open it, it's all, only male voices all the time, all the time, and they needed women. And they told me so, they were really honest with it. But they told me, you know, Marie, oh, Paris is a small city, so they, they, they knew me, they say, tu, tu sais, Marie. You know, Marie, it's very serious, this, this part of between seven and nine, it's all only about politics, about sociology, about serious subjects. So we would like you to do something, you know, light, something a bit funny, something, you know. So I was. <laughs> And uh, as a woman, of course. Like, so I decided to accept it and do de l'entrisme, en fait. The very first chronicles I did was, for example, that they were, I'm very proud that that one was, what can you do of your Christmas tree after Christmas? <laughs> 
And once I have delivered two or three things like that, I started talking about things that really interest me. <laughs> and, and they were a bit, wow, wow, she thinks. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm not exaggerating. And so now I'm part of it. But it's also, I realized that as a woman, it's, it's actually, I have integrated a lot of stereotypes. And when all these men start fighting, my first reaction is to retract, you know, is to keep quiet. So I have to, to force myself to be into the debate. And I, and I do it, I manage, and it does me good, actually. It's a very sort of, very shock therapy, you know? <laughs> and so last time with Henri Guénaud was very tough. And I, I think be, because I'm a woman, it, it's also interesting for, for the people. They, they hear a voice of a woman. I think I can keep calm and not be accused, you know, as always, to be hysterical or whatever. And uh, I'm... <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, but it, when, when I get out of it at night, I'm exhausted, totally exhausted. But I will do it as long as I'm amused, as long as I... And it's very interesting at the moment because of the elections. Yeah. I just wondered if it's on uh, the internet? It is on the internet, yes. You can uh, podcast it. Yeah, yeah, you can... Uh, it's France culture. France culture. France, France culture. And if you have an iPad, there is a there is an app too for that that you can uh, you can download to the yeah. all the yeah. And my last little um, this um, controversy with Henri Guénaud is a, a bit everywhere on the French internet because so you have the video because now today radio is also a video <laughs> show we are all filmed so you can watch it if you're interested yeah there's uh, actually for those of you who speak french if you do google uh, on the geno uh, dariusek there are some pretty cool stuff there like <laughs> one of those is like uh, dariusek and geno stay sharp on your french culture <laughs> and stuff like that so, so we mean but with, all, with also a lot of racist comments uh, uh, that's still work to do <laughs> <coughs> I'm sorry I couldn't I couldn't lift my head from my iPad I, I had to write it all in English because uh, so I had to read it but uh, I'm sorry about that in French I'm more, I'm more uh, spontaneous it's, it, just a question about a fairly quick comment you made but the um, for your upcoming novel the forest of words mm -hmm. fascinated me the idea uh, could you say well, a little more yeah. about that please well um I I met some people from Gabon, and um, they have this um, very um, complex ritual called the Bwiti, and it um, apparently comes from the pygmy, but it was also it was um, assimilated by the Bantu too. And uh, they they hear the forest speak. They they take a plant which is called iboga, and um, and it, it puts them in a state of mind. Of, um, it's a it's a neuro uh, it's a drug in fact, and they hear the trees speaking and for me it's incredibly poetic of course and the trees have their own legends their own way of talking and you can you can speak to them too and uh, but uh, it's also um, this idea which is universal not only from Gabon that when you hear the leaves of a tree especially the poplars in Basque country you know they do this sound and you hear things uh, you don't need to eat a plant or anything you hear things so, um, and also the metaphor of the forest is um, when I write, I always imagine there's a wall of trees in front of me and I can't find the right path. You know, I can't find the first sentence of the book. It's very difficult to enter into a new novel. It's very difficult. And, so, and at some point, for many reasons, I find a path, beginning of the path, be, be behind a big tree that was there and that blocked the view, you know? So I, the forest is very present in my mind. You get lost in the forest. And there are animals and everything. Maybe I'll ask uh, oh, somebody there who can have a question too. No, I, can, Mary. I, can, no, I, can, I can project. I was just wondering about what you were doing at the school. Um, you mm -hmm. mentioned that you were uh, teaching there, but they don't have anything for um, the students that are foreign students. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little bit surprised that they don't have any classes no, to help don't. them teach French. Mm -hmm. I feel I should come and get hired at your place. <laughs> <laughs> um, in that very um, uh, middle school, the, um, the boss, the principal, comment on appelle ça? Yeah, the principal. Yeah. is a very clever woman and she uh, fought against the, the ministry and she obtained to 
shorter the lessons, they are one hour, and they, she, with her teachers, they decided, it's a public school, right? so they, they can't do whatever they do, uh, right. but they decided to shorten the lessons to 45 minutes, mm -hmm. and all those quarters of hours that it's spared, mm -hmm. they do teach French for foreigners, but it's a very specific um, um, uh, decision. Uh, it's a, Decision. Oui. Oui. Thank you. <laughs> non, initiative. Voilà, initiative. Initiative. Thank you. <laughs> um, and my part there, I have a lot of fun in this class. It's a very hard job. I mean, the teachers are really brave. And it's, it's very hard. I'm not, I, I don't want to sound too angelic. It's really hard. But um, what I do, I go there not very often. I go there once a month only. But what I do is that, Basically, they can't write. Uh, but so I, I, when I s discovered that, I, I decided to tell them the French classic books as I would tell as I would uh, tell a soap opera. You know? mm -hmm. And my best seller there is La Princesse de Clèves. And so I, I'm, because all these people are uh, from the immigration, and they, most of them from Africa or the Arab countries, they know a lot about forced marriage. Mm -hmm. And La Princesse de Clèves is a forced marriage. So it's a story of a princess who is forced to marry a man that she doesn't like, but the man is a good guy, Monsieur Le Clerc. But two years later, she falls in love with a great uh, Duc de Nemours, etc. And so I tell a story, and they're fascinated. And, uh, and, and when her husband dies, even when she's a widow, she doesn't want to sleep with, with her lover. What? Why, what the, why does she uh, because she's a, a virtuous woman, etc. And, and so I tell the story, and I go on and on and on, and they love it. And you know, I, I write La Princesse de Clèves on the board, and Madame de Lafayette, and I explain stuff about Versailles, about whatever. And there's always, always, the, there's a, a pupil who says, "So you know the princess very well?" <laughs> <laughs> always, always. So it's really, it's. It's both funny and tragic, but I mean, they come from Cameroon. And they, I, I'm not. I, I'm not supposed to know their, their their books or legends. How can they know La Princesse de Clèves? So, it's a part of my job to welcome them, you know, and to try to to be a, to to have them to be a part of France. So I tell uh, Stendhal, Victor Hugo, this way. I do what I can. It's always very funny. But I have a, actually a question comment connected to what you just said at the end, which is, you know, you said it's part of my job, and um, earlier, you know, you were talking about, um, uh, you know, that even though you are supposed to do that writing, you cannot just stop, you know, thinking about those things that are uh, happening, you know, uh, even as a writer. So, you know, and also another question was about, you know, when you have to, what is it to be French or to prove your, your Frenchness? So. As a contemporary a French writer today, and as a woman uh, French writer today, I mean, you know, do, do you think that it is part of your job and you should continue getting involved? Do you think writers have to play a role like that in, in those questions? Or, or is it uh, really uh, detrimental for the writing? I mean, which kind of balance do you think would be uh, uh, the most important? First, I'm lucky enough to have a lot of free time because I do nothing but write and be a psychoanalyst, but I don't have too many patients. My kids are growing, so I have time. And when I write three hours a day, I'm happy and, and, and tired. So, uh, so I listen to the radio, I read the newspapers, and, I, I, and, and sometimes I react. Um, and that's part of being a citizen. But for example, I think the other writer we have in common for the website, Jean-Philippe Toussaint, does, doesn't do this sort of things. He, he keeps very quiet, I think. It doesn't that's get as wise. much in trouble as you do, that's I, for sure. I, I, well, the problem is that I get into trouble, that's for sure. But perhaps, perhaps, uh, perhaps I like it, in fact. Uh, if not, I would not do it. But it's a definition of Ber uh, BHL, Bernard Henri Lévy, the, the intellectual, or it, perhaps it comes from Sartre. But the intellectual, the intellectual is an écrivain qui lève la tête. The intellectual is a writer who lifts his head, you know, and, and acts. I don't act so much, but I, I speak, and sometimes I speak too much. <laughs> but, mm. uh, you use the forced metaphor to describe your um, story writing process. I 
would why have you was there a reason you chose forest? Do you mean the forest? The metaphor of the forest? Right. Um the reason why I chose the forest was um that perhaps very simply, very biographically, autobiographically. I was born near to a forest and uh, I, there was a forest just down the garden of my parents and it was, I would go there, I was six or seven, I, and I would get lost. And my father told me, you should put a um, uh, foulard rouge, uh, red scarf, red scarf, thank you, a red scarf on the branch and then you would see it everywhere. And I would do that and I would feel like an Indian, you know, I would feel like, and years after, when I went back to my childhood home and I, I, I went to go to the forest, I discovered that it was a very small wood. It was perhaps, I don't know, 20 trees. <laughs> but I would get lost. You know? So I, I think, I don't know, the imagination of the forest, um, it's something very deeply rooted in me I, as a dream, in fact. It's like a dream. Do I, am I answering your question? All right, well, thank you very much again. Thank you very much.